Hi, and welcome to worship for this May 10th Mother's Day service. Psalm 3 verse 8 tells us, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Certainly salvation does belong to the Lord, and we rejoice in the salvation that he has extended to us. So let's join Alec this morning in lifting our voices in song to worship the King. Good morning and happy Mother's Day, everyone. We want to welcome you online, and as we, uh, as we begin worship, I want to invite you to offer yourselves to the Lord this morning and be reminded of who you are in His eyes. i 
Give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls Thank you, Alec, for that beautiful time of worship. Well, today is Mother's Day, the day that we set aside each year to give honor to our moms. And moms, of course, are very special people. Children are sweet, dads are super, but moms are special. I mean, the father may be the head of the home, the children, the hub of the home, but without question, mom is the heart of the home. A godly mother can have a tremendous impact on her children. I think of how Rebecca influenced Jacob, or how John and Charles Wesley were influenced by their mother, Susanna, or Timothy, and how he was influenced by his mother and by his grandmother. But of course, you don't have to be a mother in order to have influence on the next generation. In fact, as Christians, the Bible calls all of us to play a role in influencing those who come behind us. With that in mind, today we're going to consider the subject, Parenting with Purpose, realizing that you don't even have to necessarily be a parent in order to have an impact on the next generation. And so what I want to share with you today is not only applicable to mothers and to fathers, but really to any Christian who wants to make a difference and share their faith with those who are coming behind them. 
With that in mind, I'm going to talk today about two fundamentals to convey and two reasons to convey them. The text for our message is taken from Psalm chapter 78, verses 4 through 8. There it says, Telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we do want to honor our mothers and thank you for the gift that they are, the heart of the home. We also, Lord, thank you for your word and for this uh, wonderful instruction on how any Christian that is serious about having an impact on the next generation can do that by following these precepts. Today, Lord, we ask that you would open your word to our hearts and minds and help us to understand it. And as always, to see how it applies to our everyday life. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin then by considering two fundamentals to convey. That is, these are the tenets that we want to make sure that we are teaching to those who come behind us. The first of these fundamentals is the greatness of God. As faithful believers, we have a duty to teach the following generations the surpassing greatness of God. In verse 4, we're told, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. Notice that we are to tell of His praiseworthy deeds, the awesome things God has done. We're to tell of His power, that He is above all powers, above all other forces that would call themselves gods, that he is the God of wonders, the one who performs miracles. It's our responsibility to teach the following generations about God's greatness. In Psalm 145, verses 3 and 4, we're told, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. Now notice here that we're told his greatness no one can fathom. I mean, think about that. There are aspects of God's greatness that are beyond our ability to fully comprehend. I mean, think about God's greatness with regards to creation. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 tells us, God said, let there be light and there was light. God is so great that he spoke the word and light came into existence. God parts the sea because of his greatness. God calms the storm because of his greatness. He heals the sick. He even raises the dead because of his surpassing power. In fact, it's by the word of his power that he created and sustains all things. Now, we live on a large planet. Compared to other planets, I suppose it's small, but yet to us, it's big. I remember when I was in the Navy, Ann and I used to live in Florida, and we traveled several times between Florida and Michigan, and where we had to go in Michigan was about an 1,100-mile trip. Now, most of the time, we took a couple of days to do the trip, but if we drove straight through, we could do it between 20 and 24 hours. Well, if we had the opportunity to actually drive around the world, we would have to take three and a half weeks at that same pace. So it's a big planet. And yet, compared to our sun, the earth is tiny. Do you realize that our planet could fit into the sun approximately 1,300,000 times? And our solar system is only One solar system among an estimated billion plus solar systems. And God made them all. 
Psalm 147 verse 4 tells us that God determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. God's greatness surpasses our understanding. And we witness his greatness in his creative power. Of course, we also witness his greatness in his abounding love and mercy. In Ephesians chapter 3, the love of Christ is said to surpass knowledge. There the Apostle Paul writes, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So God's love and mercy surpasses our knowledge. It's beyond our grasp to fully appreciate. In the book, The Fire of Your Life by Maggie Ross, is the story of a Jewish woman. She was a Holocaust survivor who every day at 4 p.m. stood outside the door of a New York cathedral, screaming obscenities and cursing at Jesus Christ. Well, week after week, this went on as she vented the pain that she had suffered as a survivor of the death camps. She believed that Christianity had done this to her. One day, a priest came out of the church just as this woman was going through this ritual of screaming these obscenities. And he looked down at her and he said to her in a kind and soft voice, why don't you come in and tell him? And then he led, to, led her into the chancel of the cathedral and left her alone at the foot of a large crucifix. About an hour later, the, pre, the priest returned where he found the woman seated at the foot of the cross. She looked up at him and said, well, he was Jewish too. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we're told that Christ committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. This is not the love of Hollywood. This is the love of God. A love that surpasses human understanding. In the great hymn, The Love of God, the lyrics go, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. It is unfathomable that God in his infinite love would send his son to die in our place. Truly, God's love is great. It surpasses our understanding. So the first fundamental that we want to convey to those who come behind us is the, the principle of God's greatness, that our God is great beyond our understanding. His creative power and his redeeming love testify to a greatness that surpasses our comprehension. And then the second fundamental we want to convey is the revelation of God. Again, in verse 5, we're told that he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. So the first fundamental has to do with the greatness of God, reaffirming his existence and his power. But this second fundamental has to do with the revelation of God, which reaffirms that God has revealed himself. Notice that the word of God has been given in the past for the instruction of future generations. The sacred scriptures, then, are God's divine revelation. They are pertinent, they are indispensable, and they are vital for the faith to be passed on to future generations. 
Now, this word that is translated testimony or witness means the divine revelation of God's person and character and the divine revelation of God's expectations. In our world, we live in a sea of confusion. How wonderful it is that the Word of God is a dependable and consistent source of wisdom and guidance. It's been said to have knowledge is to have understanding or information about something. To have wisdom is to have the ability to apply knowledge to everyday life. It's like this. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put a tomato in a fruit salad. Well, when we hear God's word and when we read God's word, we gain knowledge. But listen, when we meditate on God's word, we gain wisdom. Psalm 119 is the longest section in the Bible. And its main theme is about gaining an understanding and wisdom from God's word. In verse 97, it says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. In verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And then in verses 15 and 16, it reads, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Well, meditate is actually used five times in Psalm 119 and another 15 times in the book of Psalms. It's critically important for us to meditate on the word of God. It's an essential tool for our spiritual growth and development. Because it is as we meditate on the word of God, pondering its meaning and reflecting on its application, that we gain wisdom for everyday life. So in our text, we are told that the Word of God is given in the past for the instruction of future generations. Now, I want you to also notice the multi-generational aspect of this teaching. The psalmist, in fact, lists four generations. He talks about forefathers and their children, the children yet to be born, and their children. Four generations. So the divine mandate to us as believers is that we would teach the Word of God to our children, to our grandchildren, to our great-grandchildren. In other words, as long as we're alive, we are to be teaching the Word of God to the generations that come behind us. Now, that seems self-evident, but unfortunately, it's not. Some people take a hands-off approach to their children regarding the Christian faith. They say things like, well, they need to make their own decisions regarding spiritual things. They need to find their own way. But listen, while it is true that people need to have a personal faith, it is also true that children should be introduced to the Word of God from an early age. Proverbs 22 and 6 tells us, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And this word that is translated train literally means to start or to point in a certain direction. Proverbs 22 and 6 tells us, Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. I really like the New Living Translation of that verse. The point is, God expects us to direct our children. He expects us to point them in the right direction. In fact, in Psalm 127.4, we're told, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Like arrows. Children need to be aimed. They need to be sent off in the right direction. But unfortunately, some parents don't see it that way. In fact, some parents tend to live by the old maxim, I shot my child into the air, and where he landed, I know not where. But we're called to do better than that. We're called to direct our children toward God, called to train up our children 
in the way they should go. Not the way they want to go, but the way they should go. You see, wise parents understand that their children are under the constant influence of outside forces. And some of those influences are good, but others are not so good. And if we're going to offset the negative influences that will impact our children, then we need to take an active role in pointing them to the Lord and guiding their feet to the path of righteousness. We have a need to teach our children the Bible, to take our children to church, to teach them to value the things of God. At a minimum, Christian parents need to teach their kids about the blessings of serving God and the heartache of disobeying God. It's our first and greatest responsibility to our children, but it's also a great privilege. So when we think about the fundamentals that we want to convey to the next generation, the first of these is the greatness of God. The second is the revelation of God. But then there are two reasons to convey them. We convey these truths in order for our children, first of all, to trust God. Notice again, verse 7 tells us, then they would put their trust in God. You see, we must teach our children the word of God in order that they may trust God. Romans 10 and 17 tells us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the question is, how can we teach our children to trust God? And the answer is, by trusting God ourselves, and by sharing stories with our children about God's faithfulness. Stories from the Bible, and even stories from our own personal lives of how we have trusted God and the Lord has proven himself to be faithful. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Now the word translated trust here literally means to lie down on, or to stretch out on. Think about when you lie down on your bed at night. Well, you're putting your faith in your bed that it's going to hold you up. Or when you sit down at the dinner table, you're putting your faith in that chair that it will hold you up. Well, we are to trust God with that same kind of confidence. You don't give it a second thought. You simply trust and you act accordingly. But tragically, at times, I believe that we trust our furniture more than we trust God. Take, for example, the children of Israel. God parted the Red Sea for them. In the wilderness, he provided manna for them and water from the rock. He led them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And yet they frequently were guilty of forgetting the Lord's faithfulness. And the sad truth is that sometimes we also forget God's faithfulness. When God opened the Jordan River that the children of Israel might cross over into the promised land, He instructed the people to set up stones as a memorial of the great event. And that way, he said, future generations will see what God has done and be encouraged to put their trust in him. You see, much of the pain and the misery that people experience is the result of their forgetting God. Rather than trusting God, they lean on their own understanding. Rather than putting their faith in the Lord, well, they put their faith in human knowledge and ingenuity. But it is futile to trust in anything more than we trust in God. Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, David made that statement when he was king. And he needed military power. He needed chariots. He needed horses. He needed armed soldiers that were trained. And yet David knew that it's God alone who gives the ultimate victory. 
Today, when you look around, you see people putting their trust in all sorts of things. They trust their job. They trust their income. They trust their education. They trust the government. But friends, the Bible reminds us that God alone is fully trustworthy. Economies will fail. Human knowledge and understanding is limited. People are imperfect. But God alone is completely trustworthy. Isaiah 49 and 23 says, I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. What a beautiful truth. So the first reason that we convey these fundamental truths to our children is in order for our children to trust God. The second reason, to obey God. Again, verse 7 tells us, then they would keep his commands. You know, one of the greatest life principles that we can convey to our children is the principle of walking in obedience to God. And this is an area that the children of Israel had real problems with. I mean, in the wilderness, their commitment to obedience was lacking. And so their obedience itself was inconsistent. As a result, they suffered many setbacks and many disappointments. And if we're not careful, we can be just as fickle and just as inconsistent. This is why James warns us, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You see, as followers of Christ, we need to teach our children that God is the great creator of heaven and earth. That he has revealed himself through his holy word. That he entered into our human experience through his beloved son. His word is true. His nature is holy. His character is faithful. And he is completely trustworthy. And these powerful truths provide the motivation for obedient living. I mean, think about it. You can obey God because his word is true. You can obey God because his nature is holy. You can obey God because his character is faithful and he is completely trustworthy. I remember when I was a kid, uh, first home that my parents built was on a dirt road. And one spring we had an inordinate amount of rain and it literally turned that mud road into a muddy, sticky mess. I mean, it was so bad, you literally couldn't drive on it. And I remember for that week or so, we had to park our car at the end of the road on the shoulder of the paved road. And then we had to take our books and groceries or whatever we had. And we had to slog all the way home, about a mile down the road, through mud that was sticky and deep, probably six or eight inches. I mean, it was the kind of mud where if you weren't careful, your boot would get stuck and come right off your foot. But once we made it to our driveway, my dad had built a series of boardwalks that would take us from the road up to the house. And as long as we stayed on those boardwalks, we were just fine. But if we slipped off, we would immediately get stuck in the mud. As I was getting this message ready, I thought about how life can be like that. Wet, muddy, sticky road. God's commands are like those boardwalks. They provide us with a sure path for our feet. They enable us to continue our progress on our spiritual journey. God's commands prevent us from getting stuck in the mud. Well, as faithful believers, we have a duty to pass our Christian faith onto the generations that come behind us. And in order to do that, we need to teach them about the greatness of God and the Word of God, that they may come to trust in God and obey Him in all areas of their lives. And then, as they do those things, it can be said of them, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Shall we pray? 
Heavenly Father, again today, we do thank you for your word and for the wisdom that we find there. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember the importance of passing our faith on to the generations that follow us, that we would teach them of your greatness, that we would teach them of your revelation as contained in your word. And doing so, Father, that those who follow us would find that they can trust you and they can obey you in all areas of their lives. And now, Lord, as we give back to you a portion of that which you have blessed us with, we ask that you would take these tithes and offerings, that you would multiply them and give us wisdom to know how best to invest them in your kingdom's work. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I would remind you that there are a couple of ways that you can give. You can, of course, send your financial contributions to the church's physical address at 723 St. Louis Road, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. Or you can visit us online at www.fbcollinsville.org and then scroll down to the bottom of the screen and click on the green Give button. God bless you as you continue to give to the work of the Lord. the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, the great I priest whose name is Lord, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is
Before we leave, let me just give you a couple of quick announcements. I want to remind you of the pastor's Bible study that takes place on Thursdays at 11 a.m. You can link to our Zoom conference by clicking on the link that's provided at our Facebook page. Uh, and then also on Wednesday at 6.30, we have prayer meeting, and we are meeting here at the church. We're social distancing by providing uh, different areas to meet in the church with no more than 10 meeting per place. But you can also uh, connect through video conferencing through a Zoom link, again, made available through our Facebook page. So just want to remind you of those two opportunities and encourage you to take advantage of them. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord give you his peace both now and forevermore. Amen.